Good morning. Uh, thank you for joining the, the Fiber Channel Industry Association sponsored webinar titled Data Center Scalability Made Easy with Fiber Channel Services. Today is August 26th, and uh, we have two, pres uh, two great presenters uh, who know all about Fiber Channel and Fiber Channel Services today with us. Uh, Barry is uh, Barry Mascas is a uh, uh, HPE uh, Hewlett Packard uh, storage networks technical consultant with at least 40 years of uh, product design and development experience. He has uh, spent a lot of time with uh, Fiber Channel in customer environments, in research labs, um, and has made a lot of contributions to Fiber Channel and its progress. Uh, we also have uh, Dave Peterson. He, Dave is a, a principal engineer with Broadcom in the Brocade Storage Networking Division. Dave is the technical editor for the FCP standards, the FCNVME standards, and FCSW standards, and chair of the FCFS and FCGS work groups with T11. Uh, Dave is also the NSITS T11 international representative, the NSITS SC25 WG4 TAG chair, and a deputy technical advisor for the United States National Committee TAG to JTC1 slash SC, 25 years in the international standards realm. Dave has been involved with networking and storage since 1983 and standards development since the mid 90s two very accomplished presenters today presenting about uh, the details of Fiber Channel services. So what is Fiber Channel? Fiber Channel Industry Association, actually, to be specific. So Fiber Channel Industry Association is a group of uh, vendors who work in Fiber Channel technology to make it uh, stable, make it standards-based. Uh, the association has been in uh, uh, has been in existence 25 plus years. Uh, a lot of, uh, like, or all the fiber channel participants basically are uh, participate in fiber channel industry association proceedings one way or the other, contribute to it, uh, advance it, and implement it, and make sure that we are adhering to standards. And that's why it's a very stable kind of network with a lot of standard services available. Uh, it is one of the largest uh, uh, connectors of storage with. Uh, uh, storage with uh, uh, your servers and offering uh, storage services. More than 142 million uh, ports, fiber channel ports, have been shipped since 2001 at various different speeds. Um, so, what what makes fiber channel great is basically it's a purpose-built network designed specifically for storage, and it's standardized in 1994. Has been actually we have been moving standards forward as the technology evolves, as the new technology emerges, and as the new technology gets discovered. So Fiber Channel has been a complete network solution for uh, connecting storage. Uh, uh, def it basically, the protocol defines both physical network infrastructure and data transport protocols. So it's all uh, all in one package that offers lossless congestion-free systems. Um, it offers uh, multiple upper layer protocols like uh, SCSI, TCP IP, NVMe, et cetera. Um, it has multiple topologies, basically point to point to switched fabrics, et cetera. Um, it has multiple speeds, basically 8, 16, 32, et cetera. So all those, uh, all those speeds, and they can coexist together without negotiations, zoning. Um, there is a lot of security services offered. There's a lot of resiliency um, uh, that is designed into the fiber channel network protocol, and that's why it's a very stable network and chosen by uh, most of the customers. Mm. So uh, I, I'm going to uh, uh, I'm going to present it. I, I'm going to pass on the uh, uh, the baton to the uh, to the presenters. But before I do that, just one quick announcement: if you have any questions, please type those in into the questions uh, uh, questions from audience tab. Um, uh, the also, and we'll answer those questions at the end of the presentation. Also, uh, the slides, the, uh, the slides being presented are already available for download from attachments and links uh, a section of the website here. Uh, you can download them and uh, uh, print them for taking notes and, and uh, or maybe follow along. So without further ado, I'm ready to hand it over to Dave. Dave, you ready? 
I am. Okay. Right, thank Take you, Karen, and help. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, we can. All right, very good. All right, thank you. All right, hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us. On the agenda today, I'll be talking about what fiber channel services are, I'll be providing an, up, or an overview of longstanding fabric services and what the newer fabric services provide. Then Barry will be covering uh, what is FCCT and how it relates to the fiber channel fabric services. And I'll finish up with fiber channel generic services and switch fabric functionality and a potential fabric services down the road. Then we'll finish up with Q&A if time permits. All right. But before we start, the acronyms and the applicable insights fiber channels, fiber channel standards in this webinar that we're talking about, uh, just kind of highlight with the four standards. First one, uh, we got the generic services, FCGF7, which specifies the uh, FCCT, which is a common transport that Barry will be providing more details down the road. Uh, we got the directory service there, we got the management service there, we got event service, and uh, all our generic services are covered in GS7. And uh, on the switch fabric side, we got FCSW7, which specifies the distributed services, and it also specifies fabric configuration, which is the personal switch selection process, and also path selection. There's many much more functionality in the document, but what I want to note, there are people who come out of this webinar today that uh, I've noticed that some people I would believe that uh, fabric configuration, path selection are part of FC fabric services, and in my mind they are not, and, but I can further discuss that with you down the road. But anyways, uh, then we got LS4, which is the link services, which specifies the fabric login and our state change notification ELSs, and uh, the base document, which is fiber channel framing and sig signaling-5, and the notable one in here, other than the framing and signaling, is the sp specification of the clock synchronization server. All right. So what are fiber channel services? Fabric services are a set of functional entities that, as a whole, provide for the management and scalability of fiber channel fabrics. They fall into three categories. I got them specified here. I call it the fabric login service. That's specified in LS4. That's the flog ELS. And we got our state change service. That's specified in LS4 and SW7, which is our state change registration and the RCN ELSs. Then we got the generic services, and those are specified in GS8. Like I mentioned, those are the directory service management service. I'll be touching on those a little bit. I think Barry does a little further dive in his in this section. All right, so note, again, fabric services are not based fabric operational func functional entities, which I mean is such as, like I said, fabric configuration and path selection. And, also note, fabric services are addressed via well-known addresses, see them well, WKAs, which is a similar concept as the telco model, where, and here's my number if you want to talk to me. All right, moving forward, this is just kind of a slide on what I call long-standing service, which is the fabric login service, which is at the F port controller well-known address all F, Fox, Easy. And the important thing is fabric login is the method by which an endport establishes its operating environment with a fabric. It gets its endport ID, the worldwide names associated with ports are exchanged, along with service parameters, such as the buffer and buffer to credit, and there's a bunch of more stuff like that. But Put together a little diagram here. The yeah, plug is just sent from the end device, and we get a, an accept back from the switch. At that point, the endpoint end device has an address, and he is functional on the fabric. But then there's more steps that need to be performed, and I just took an example of uh, 
uh, utilizing the, uh, the startup process that's typically used used in the FCP realm. We got another long standing fabric service that comes into play, and this is the directory service, which is the name server subtype. And that's that well known address, Fox Charlie. So after fabric login, the end device sends a, a port login to the name server, and it registers as FC4 information, such as the FC4 type and FC4 features. And just puts more information into the fabric for end devices to go out and further query. Here's the process. So there's our register FC4 type object. In this mind, yeah, we'd register our FCP. For example, and we're going to accept and we register our FC4 features, which, uh, for example, gives an indication are you an initiator or target port or you, you support both functions. So, boom, now we got our, our FC4 associated information into the name server. And let's see, moving on. Then another example of another uh, service that comes into play, like I mentioned before, is the state change service. Now this is at the fabric controller well-known address Fox Dog. And after registering with the name server and our login, state change registration SCR ELS is sent to registered and received RSCNs, which is registered state change notifications from the fabric controller. And then name server queries are sent to update the, the databases. And here's some diagrams on that. So we got SCR going into the switch. And oh, by the way, got another end device out there in the fabric logging in. He registers his FC4 information. And at some time, implementation specific of the switch is going to generate an RSCN to the other end device. And boom, that end device is going to come out with name server queries to determine what what happened. So the, some of the uh, there's four different uh, state change registration uh, capabilities. First one being fabric detected, where you register to receive all RCN requests issued by the fabric controller for all events, all events detected in the fabric. Then we got end port detected registration, which registers to receive all RCN requests issued for events detected by the affected end port. Then we also go fabric name change registration. You get to receive a fabric name change RCN. Then we got a newer concept that came in a few years ago was a peer zone name or change registration, where we get the indications of change peer zoning RSCN. All right. And then, yeah, here's the, the long standing generic fabric services. Now, these are the ones all specified in the GS. And like I mentioned, we have the directory service, which has subtypes. Of the name server, we also got a the identification server, and a little more on the the identification server. That's kind of a newer one too. That maintains the mappings between the what we call global and virtual entity IDs and fabric virtual entity IDs, which is used by the priority tagging mechanism, which is specified in LS4. So you want to get some gory details on there. There's a clause in that. It talks about the identification server and priority tagging mechanism. And we got the management service. Uh, I didn't bust out all the subtypes here. I'll do that in the next slides. And uh, then we got the clock service, which we mentioned, that allows clocks located when in the nodes to be readily synchronized to microsecond accuracies. It's a uh, very granular. And this is actually still probably in use that I'm aware of uh, in the avionics environments. And it goes back to almost 15 plus years ago. But the bottom line is, you know, the avionics folks are still using fiber channel. And uh, one of the pilots I know, it just, stuff just works. So they really like it. Then the last one we got is the event service, which kind of surprised me. I know the, the person that put this in the in the standard, but uh, this service was uh, was actually developed with the goal of replacing RSCN, but never quite did that. And at this time, I'm not aware of any implementation. So, all right. 
And I'll go through these quickly. I think Barry's got some more on uh, management server stuff, but from a high level, manage, management server subtypes are, we got a fabric configuration server, which provides a way for management application to discover fabric channel, fabric volumes and attributes. Then we got unzoned name server, which provides a management application access to the name server database without zone constraints. Then we got the fabric zone server, which provides a management application access to and control of fabric zones. And the zone ins, we got soft zoning and hard zoning, and I think Barry's going to touch on that a bit too. Right. More management service subtypes. We actually got a security policy service, which provides in band protocol for controlling and extracting security policy, policy information. And uh, we got the companion, which is a security information server, which provides an in band protocol for observing and controlling operational security information. Uh, note that the security information server does not provide any access to fabric security policy information, which is the object of the security policy server. So there is some exclusion between those. Then we also have a, a subtype called fabric device management interface, which FDMI, that provides for the management of devices such as HBAs more end devices through the fabric. Then you hit the button. We come to the uh, the newer management service subtypes. Uh, the latest ones, we've got the enhanced fabric configuration server. And again, it's very similar, provides the same functionality as the uh, earlier fabric configuration server, but it has additional queries. And along, uh, we specify a new fabric object and a transport infrastructure object. Then the latest and greatest one, uh, along with the priority tagging method, is the application server. And this provides a way to manage application-specific services, such as virtual machine identifiers, and along with it, any associated ASCII attributes, such as the entity name, host identifier, and symbolic name. And on that, I threw together a slide. Here's an application server virtual machine identifier example. We've got the normal fabric login goes, and we got an import login. Uh, this is enhanced for quick detection and supporting devices. That means uh, we added a application header support bit in the P loggy. So it indicates, yep, I actually support the application header. Then as again, we uh, register the SC4 type information, and again, this is a unique type for application services. And we register virtual machines, we get uh, tags back. Then we can go out and query for our virtual machine peers. And the bottom line, in the end, we have virtual machine tag flows with a unique fabric identifier going back and forth. All right, so we're getting close to my first end of the presentation here. And this one is actually kind of interesting to me. It's more on uh, obsolete fabric services. And bottom line is note there has been many fabric services that have been obsolete over the years. So this is kind of a history lesson for me, and it's kind of cool. But going back, in the directory service, we actually had an X500 service. That was specified in the first uh, FCGS. And removed in GS2. We also had an IP address server. That was obsolete in GS4. On the management service side, we had a performance server, which was added to GS4 as an informative annex, and then it was removed in GS7. And finish out the absolute fabric services side. We even had a multicast server. That was obsolete a long time ago, back in FS3. Then, what's it called? The uh, key distribution service, which is similar to the uh, the uh, security policy server, blah, 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 and the, the management service. And that was removed in GS4. We had an alias service, poofed in GS7, and the time service. And we'll hand it over to Barry for more on FCCT. Well, thank you, David. You bet. Um, I just wanted to bring it up a little bit. 
put a little context around the fabric services. I think one thing that uh, I've come to appreciate in, in the way Fiber Channel works is that there are very common data structures. Um, and that's what I want to focus on a little bit here. Um, the FCCT, which is uh, specified as part of the uh, FCGS8 standard. Um, it, it is the packet structure that helps ensure standardized deployment and hence leads to uh, seamless scalability. Now, this has been fundamental to Fiber Channel for a very long time. And, you know, it is part of the fabric service portfolio, this idea of common transport, uh, which means that there's a common packet structure that allows end devices to put and get information. Um, and using the the WECAs, the well-known addresses, for those services. So um, a lot of us don't appreciate the fact that, that, that FCCT is at play basically all the time in a fiber channel fabric. Um, and uh, it is, uh, I think, a very underappreciated aspect of fiber channel. But it, the point is it, it, it underpins the services uh, these services aren't normally available in an Ethernet fabric. Um, you know, simple things like name service, et cetera, can be all over the place. So um, FCCT creates a, a, an entry port, I, entry point into the fabric for all the services in a common, consistent uh, way. So, um, you know, building a SAN is pretty low risk. Uh, we like to think it's plug and play. Why is it plug and play? Well, we have, you know, a common transport. We have common services. Um, but, you know, there are some things you need to pay attention to or you'll get into trouble when you start to plug in and scale up your, your, your SAN. And, and those are fundamental things like the domain ID and the principal switch and, and how you set those up to be static or dynamic. But the ultimate goal is, is that you can configure a series of topologies. Uh, some are well known, some are kind of weird, but uh, Fiber Channel allows you uh, to create a loop-free environment um, and simple plug and play. And endports that can attach to that fabric have an ability using the common transport to communicate their information and get information uh, from the services and, uh, you know, literally up and running plug and play in, in a matter of minutes. So it is really a low risk solution, right? You're not using spreadsheets and other complicated mechanisms to try to manage a, a complex network. Uh, so we're today focused on GS8, it sits at the FC4 level, um, and it provides the context as a standard for the services um, that are all built around a common transport, the FCCT. Uh, as I was trying to illustrate, you know, you literally plug and play, and the services take care of the fabric, uh, the end devices can register and find out who else is in the fabric. Again, there are constructs that allow you to control that visibility. Uh, there are also constructs that allow you to operate without zone constraints, right? You get to see services and see fabric information um, independent of the zone construct. So that's the difference between management and fabric. Uh, and directory, right? So a manager, if authorized, can see across the fabric, uh, whereas a particular end device <coughs> can only see within its zone or construct if it's not zoned. 
generic <coughs> services protocol is um, embedded in every switch, uh, the FC common transport, FCCT protocol. It's a standard protocol, and it's, it's very basic request and response using WECAs, well-known addresses uh, of the distributed services, right? So if you're on switch four and you need the information from switch eight, right, you don't really have to know much in order to go to the WECA to get that information, right? Uh, the, again, the fabric manages the distributed service provides the request and response to the appropriate area, um, the appropriate switch and the service in that switch. Um, now, just to be clear, uh, you know, there are services and then there are operational services. So when we think of SCCT, we think of it, it's a service for an end device to obtain services, right? So it's a common access method, standardized common access method. For, for all your attached devices. But it doesn't really perform the services. It just transports the requests and the responses. And as Dave was pointing out, it, it, it doesn't really uh, drive uh, the, the uh, routing protocol, uh, the Fabric uh, Shortest Path, uh, well-known uh, Fabric routing protocol that Fiber Channel has been built around which has its own standard and uh, is defined separately. So the SCCT um, today is basically built around the management server and the directory slash name server at the uh, well-known address FA and FC. Uh, as Dave mentioned, the event server, um, although there is a standard, it's little implemented. And then there are extended services at uh, at uh, additional uh, well-known addresses. Uh, the fabric controller, which, you know, you won't get up and operate unless you communicate with the fabric controller at the FD address. Um, and, you know, the, the FCCT protocol is very uh, simplified. It's exchange-based. Uh, so that gives you some serialization of the request and the response. Uh, it also gives you, you know, air control, and it also gives you a mechanism if that service can't be provided at the at the moment you asked for it, um, the service can tell you know reject your request, and you can come back and ask for that service at a later time. So these mechanisms have been built into Fiber Channel for a long time. They scale. There's no fundamental limit. And it does allow multiplexing, right? So you can have a thousand servers asking for service, and because of the exchange-based context, they can all be kept in a serial fashion, managed appropriately, and responded to uh, appropriately. Um, sort of at a logical abstract, you know, uh, you can think of the FCCT as a client interface uh, to um, ask for and request and and respond to services. Um, you know, in sort of a physical model, you have end ports connected to switches. The switch is have distributed services. An end port requests information from a switch, um, and the switch uh, through the FCCT will provide responses to those end ports. Uh, just in a quick summary, uh, when we think of fiber channel fabric services, uh, you know, they enable the SAN management using the management server. They enable the directory, who's in the fabric, and what are some of their attributes. Uh, they have the fabric controller. Um, are you connected to the fabric? Are you notified of changes? And then we have the login server, right, where you hand out uh, your IDs manage your IDs, and um, manage a database uh, related to who's in and who's out and what their attributes are. And then there's sort of extended services, as we have talked about, where FDMI allows you to register 
um, additional information if you need it. And, you know, I like the little button that says service not available. Um, these are not Ethernet-based uh, services. These are fiber channel-based services. Uh, just a, a quick flow diagram. Uh, it is very important, uh, you know, after you uh, connect with your login uh, through the Fabric Controller, you have to have a, a, a P loggy uh, accepted in uh, using the FCCT protocol to the well-known address before you can actually use uh, the services provided. Right, so there is an authentication pro, uh, context that is required in order for services to be provided. You know, you get that P loggy. Once you have that P loggy after the F loggy, you know, and you register, um, you can be notified of fabric changes, but more importantly, you're now enabled to start to query uh, the name service uh, in order to get operational information such as Who's an initiator? Who's the target I want to communicate with? And then you can use that information to uh, advance your uh, logical connection with a target uh, or, an, if need be, another initiator. Um, it, from a trace perspective, we can see uh, fundamentally the flow is you get the F loggy, you're talking to the fabric controller, the fabric controller will accept your F login. Uh, and your service parameters are exchanged, and then you start communicating with the management server, right? So now you can see that there's a whole series of, uh, of requests in order to interrogate the fabric and, and extended fabric parameters, who's in the fabric, uh, and then you can actually go, and, and in this example, I have a, a blade server that has end servers behind that physical uh, port that logged in. And so now they uh, are enabled at a point uh, to start to register their information uh, into the fabric and into the name service. So again, this is the very standardized facilitated by the FCCT. Once you've established your P login, uh, you're able to advance your whole solution quite rapidly. and um, understand how the fabric is set up. So uh, the service itself, a client originates an exchange, uh, transmits the request, waits for the response, and sends the next request. It's an interlocked sort of half duplex operation, but you can think of it having uh, high parallelism throughout the fabric. A common transport, um, it, it's uh, a sequence to transfer all information, right? And, and the size of the payload is variable and can be specified. And the preamble can also be tailored specifically um, if you're going to have a secure, which is recommended by the standard to have secure uh, information unit transfers, um, as well as there are um, an enabled uh, in the standard and in the fabrics you can have vendor specific. So if a customized uh, solution is needed, uh, you can create your own variation of a service uh, get and um, response. Uh, so uh, I always like to say that standards are a platform for innovation. And, and we can see here as a working example through SCCT, it has been built into the standard that you can innovate, any particular vendor or collection of vendors can innovate on use of the common transport and create their own unique uh, variation on solutions that you know, may play in parallel with or in addition to uh, the common services. So a uh, generic service operation is an exchange of information units, a very simple request and response, and then there is an ability to reject or accept, you know, those payloads and provide those payloads. And if there is an error, you know, there's a policy a, a well known in Fiber Channel where you do an abort and you discard uh, the rest of the sequences, 
and you may uh, restart that exchange or a different exchange. So just a word, as I mentioned, uh, you know, the FCCT um, can be uh, authenticated. It can be encrypted. It can uh, have a cryptographic transformation so that it is secure and actually hidden from, you know, if you could uh, smart, uh, snoop it. Um, so there is a, a very uh, structured uh, preamble that can be set up in order for you to have a secure and confidential exchange of service information. So just bringing it back up in summary, we have a directory server at Weka FC. Uh, the name server is a function of the directory server. Um, it's distributed service, uh, so you can register, uh, you can remove, and you can query. Uh, and you, you can always think of services available as an end port, as a node port. Uh, the Weka, in, in effect, is a, a node port. Um, and it responds to the requests and uh, provides responses. So the consumer is normally a driver on your end device, and the information uh, is operational. And so if it's operational, it's subject to zoning restrictions on the node. And so the directing server provides access uh, transparently, in a way, to distributed database across the fabric. Uh, so a very simple model, right? Uh, Endport does a request to the Fabric uh, directory server. Um, the information is validated because of the PLOGI. Uh, the request is sent to the appropriate uh, Fabric entity. And then uh, the response is sent back based on, you know, the FC4 type and the ID. and uh, and the, and the service requested. Uh, we all should be familiar with the name server because it's the thing that most people touch when they are managing a fiber channel fabric. Uh, and, you know, there are, it's based on a, you know, client server exchange of objects, uh, get, register, deregister, and delimit. Uh, the available objects are, are the port identifier, the FC4 type, the features, the name, symbolic, and node, port and node, uh, hard address if you uh, are using hard addresses, uh, node name, port name, port type, permanent port, class of service, and your fabric port name. So the name server is distributed among switches, making the name server available to every end port once you have successfully completed. And again, the mechanism is the FCCT framework uh, for requesting the service and getting a response from that service. There's really no inherent name server scale limit defined in the standard. The name server, if any of you have scaled up a fabric, it, it, the name service scales with the fabric as a distributed database. Um, the name server is populated, you know, with parameters during the F loggy. Uh, there's a protocol using the CT information units uh, with an exchange in order to uh, put information and get information. And again, if zones exist, your information may be filtered based on the zoning construct. Uh, just a quick example of the data in a name server. Uh, this is an NNS show, which is, you know, an obvious uh, uh, B switch. Um, the important thing here is that this idea of the initiator uh, having you register um, that you're an initiator or a target or both uh, has led to, um, as the standards have progressed, has led to automation. And, and the automation, and Dave mentioned it, is you know, this target-driven zoning approach where the fabric can understand initiators and targets and automatically zone them uh, in 
sort of pairwise, uh, which is a fiber channel best practice, right, to use pairwise zoning, um, single initiator, single target, right? Uh, that simplifies the RSCN management uh, for the fabric, and it also keeps your nodes from being polluted um, should, you know, something happen in the fabric that really is not your problem or not your end port device's problem or target problem. Another uh, important thing, uh, as you see, you know, we, we have added uh, FCN BME as a uh, FC4 type. And you can see that an initiator can operate with both protocols in concurrent fashion. Uh, you can run the SCSI FCP or you can uh, operate with your FCN BME um, and run both at the same time, register both, or you can do one or the other. So this is sort of an example of how using the common transport, we've been able to enhance the standard to allow these new capabilities to be registered and seen and operated upon. Uh, this is a classic C uh, switch uh, using the database. And again, uh, you see that the SCSI and NBMEOF initiator type is there. Uh, as well as, um, you know, it is an initiator. And then you have your other service and worldwide name and port identifier, etc. cetera. Uh, so the management server, uh, it provides uh, a well-known address for fabric configuration and for zoning control and management. So you can think of the management server as a service that can operate above the zoning information. In fact, it's responsible for creating the zoning information and enforcing it and distributing it, uh, you know, such as activation. So it's, I think of it, the management server as a database management server that you access through the FCCT uh, in order to propagate the information as required uh, throughout the fabric. Uh, the management service, uh, you know, covers a lot of different areas in terms of, you know, the fabric configuration, such as if you needed to establish a static uh, ID um, or uh, activate a zone across the fabric, or if you need to look at who's not zoned across the fabric. Um, it allows you to put zones in place to move uh, uh, objects such as alias names uh, and alias zone names into zones and zone sets and activate them and distribute them. Um, and then uh, you can have, uh, as Dave mentioned, some of the newer services for specific objects uh, related to, for example, uh, FDMI or enhanced registration of certain information objects and getting those objects. I just wanted to, uh, I think I skipped the slide there, sorry. Yes, all right. So this is my last slide. Um, I just wanted to make it aware that, for example, um, you know, we have basic zoning, and as the standard has progressed, we have enhanced zoning. So enhanced zoning was an opportunity uh, to automate fabric uh, zoning, right? So. Uh, not only does it uh, enhance the ability to distribute changes in zones and zone sets throughout the fabric, it gives you an ability uh, to automate the initiator target zoning. Uh, and, uh, you know, we call it uh, target-driven zoning. There are other names that have been used for it. But there's this very simple semantic that was built into the fabric to, to say, hey, let's use basic zoning or let's use enhanced zoning. And here's how we do it and here's how we set it, right, using the FCCT protocol. Um, and then, you know, you've got the GFIS and the SFIS uh, acronyms uh, that allow you to um, uh, operate either as a basic or an enhanced fabric. Uh, the important thing to note is that you can't operate mixed, right? If you're 
basic, you're basic. If you're enhanced, you're enhanced. Um, and as long as we all understand that, uh, once you flip from one to the other, then you're good to go and use the automation uh, in the enhanced zoning. So back to you, David. All right, thanks, Barry. Can you hear me okay? Just fine. All right, very good. All right, moving on to FC Generic Services, uh, switch fabric functionality and how they relate. We're getting uh, tight on the top of the hour, so I'm probably going to run through these a little quick, but uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to send them your way. So, bottom line for Fiber Channel, a distributed service model is used to allow a fabric to provide consistent services to all attached inboards. For, for FC, distributed server is what we call contained in the switch. This actually means it does not mean the entity is physically inside the switch. It may be outside the switch. But typically, yes, every switch does have, have that entity inside it. But architecturally, there's no required. But here's the, the big piece for distributed services that uh, provide all the, the good stuff. Basically, distributed services are mapped to a common framework with the goal to provide three things, consistent method for distributing services across switches in a fabric, distribution method that is topology independent, and a method that preserves processing facilities for existing frame formats, which is very important. And again, note the distributed service model is specified in SW7 standards. All right. Uh, and to meet the common framework goal, a distributed server consists of the transport, common characteristics, work categories, and again, frame formats. Again, note, if zoning is present in a fabric, distributed service may be affected with the following rules. Switch to switch communications are not zoned. And note, this only applies to class F CT header based distributed service frames and also zoning is applied by the entry switch, which means if a particular distributed switch is affected by zoning, it is the responsibility of that entry switch to make sure that the requesting import does not receive data for that distributed service that is outside the zone. All right, so on the transport, like we're, we've been saying here again, yeah, that distributed services use FCCT. Again, the CT frames are set using class F, which is very similar to class two. The DID is set to the domain controller of the destination switch. SID is set to the domain controller of the source switch. Type field set to 20, indicating fiber channel fabric, generic fabric services. Uh, I should note before I go too far on this one, uh, a little bit on entry switches. So in this context for the initiator, initiator uh, switch 10 is the entry switch. And for like target one, switch 20 would be the entry switch, and switch 30 for target two. So that mind, uh, for distributed service request, a remote switch does not send a response directly to the requesting end port. All responses are sent to the entry switch. The entry switch is responsible sending the appropriate response to the requesting end port. And the import communicates with the distributed services via the well-known address. And you'll see, start to see some commonalities as we go here. So, and again, imports do send distributed service requests and do not, do send, excuse me. And the distributed services request responses are sent between switches, not between the switch and the import. So that should be, you know, do not send. There's a typo there. Uh, all right, moving on. So common characteristics. Uh, so each distributed, distributed services share a set of common characteristics. These include timeouts, where uh, the quest between switches, the timeout value is five seconds. Then we got the concept of local data copies. Uh, local data copies may be absolutely allowed by a distributed service. And then we got the concept of exchange management or each request between switches is mapped to a unique exchange. Multiple outstanding requests are allowed between a, switch, a pair of switches 
up to the end-to-end -end credit resource values provided by the receiving switch. All right, moving forward. Then we got responses. Yep, each request sent receives a response. And if the receiving switch is unable to perform an operation, it responds with a reject, specifying a appropriate reason code, reason code explanation. We're getting better on that these days. And if response is not received from all switches to which a, a request was sent within the timeout period, then the request is considered partial and a response is sent back to the end port as appropriate for the service. All right, on, on partial responses, yeah, for many requests, even a partial response to the requesting endpoint is useful. That's why we have this concept in. A partial request uh, may occur for a number of reasons, such as one of the switches uh, request is direct to is too busy and not able to respond with, within the timeout period, or one of the switches the request is directed to does not support the service. And the service may allow partial responses for a subset of its requests. It's up to the service to specify. And if the response to a request is partial, the partial response bit is set to one in the CT header of the response sent back. All right, so getting the end of the common characteristics, we got the concept of a data merge, which describes how to merge all the Information for the databases, those again are specified by the service. Then we got the concept of error recovery, where if an error is on a distributed service rate is detected, for example, no act is received or you get a port busy, the frame may be retransmitted for a time limit up again to five seconds. All right, moving on to work categories. Work categories are definitions that allow a consistent mapping of services two distributed services. Categories define how each distributed service maps its commands to the distribution characteristics. And we've got four work categories being local, one-to-one, -one, one to many, and one to all. All right, on for the local work category definition, local requests are those that may be handled entirely by the entry switch. Whereas a request is local for the following reasons, the data, the data being requested is owned entirely by the entry switch, and that's dependent on the type of the request, and the entry switch is also maintaining a local copy of the data being requested. And any request that is determined to be local is processed as appropriate for the service that's defined in GS8. And we got a one-to-one -one Category is defined as a request that is unable to be handled entirely by the entry switch, and the entry switch has identified a single remote switch that may handle the request, and the local switch sends the request frame directly to the domain controller of that switch. And for a one to many work category, it's defined as a request that is unable to be handled entirely by the entry switch again, and the entry switch has identified multiple remote switches that may handle the request. In this case, the local switch sends request frames directly to the domain controller of all remote switches that is identified to contain requested data. And the last one is a one to all work category, and that's defined as a request is unable to be handled entirely by the entry switch, and the entry switch is unable to identify any remote switch to query. And in this case, the entry switch sends frames directly to all domain controllers of all switches. All right, so then the important thing, as I mentioned, and for frame formats, yeah, the important thing is where possible, we use the same frame formats for switch to switch communications. They're used for end ports. Reuse of code is very good. Uh, let's see, we're getting to the top of the hour. Here's some, uh, Here's an overview of distributed servers, starting with a name server. And you'll see some commonalities again here, where each switch contains its own name server called the DNS. Each DNS within the switch is responsible for the name entries associated with the domains assigned to the switch. Each DNS within the switch only returns the information associated with the domains for which the switch is responsible. 
And again, the client import sends its name server request to the entry switch via the well-known address. And if the required information is not available, the DNS within the local switch services the request appropriately. And as we mentioned here, as I mentioned, yeah, this is where the services, they specify all the common characteristics, right? So here's where the DNS may maintain local copies. Uh, the integrity is maintained via SWRSCNs. And this implies all switches distribute SWRSCNs throughout the fabric whenever change takes place in their local database. Communication between the, the DNSs to acquire requested information is transport to the client. And uh, partial responses, again, are allowed. Uh, and again, here's the distributed management server. Again, same, similar concepts here. I don't have to hit on the highlights. Uh, very similar to the, the name server here on this slide. Uh, again, it can may maintain local copies and notifies other DMSs that they should remove local data copies. And very similar characteristics again. Partial responses are allowed. And, uh, and it talks about zoning specifically uh, in uh, the impact of the security information requests. And we got the distributed DE identification server. Again, very similar concepts, uh, characteristics. Uh, nothing notable of difference there. Uh, the further detail, the DVIS may maintain local copies. And again, he notifies other changes of the mappings and the communications again the sim and is transparent uh, all right so we're getting to the end here so here's a slide on potential fabric services which is a uh, newer information that uh, we've been working on for the past couple of years in fiber channel and uh, so potential fabric services down the road we talked about this a little bit is the concept of a congestion management service or server that may be developed in the future as a result of functionality that uh, we've been working on related to fabric performance. And this was recently improved into the latest FCLS5. Uh, we got the concept of a, a new fabric performance impact notification ELS, and that has four different uh, flavors in there. We got a link integrity, delivery notification, peer congestion, and a congestion notification. And similar, we even went further down the level into the FC2 level, and we specified two new primitive signals to FCFS6, an RBF1, meaning a warning congestion signal, and an RBF7. So uh, those familiar with performance stuff uh, might get some latencies, processes, and things at the ELS level. So that's all I got, and I'll send it back over to Kieran. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate it. So uh, uh, this was a great presentation, and thank you, uh, Barry and Dave. And uh, I'm, I'm sure people learned a lot. I, I myself did. Uh, so uh, the, I had a summary slide there, right? Uh, so <laughs> as you can see, basically, Fiber Channel offers a lot of services, makes it very easy to uh, uh, to scale the, the scale the network, manage the network, uh, troubleshoot it, uh, uh, get information about uh, about different services uh, that are running actually always in the background to make it more robust and and dependable. Uh, I'm going to I, we are at the top of the hour, so I'm going to skip the questions uh, for now. We can definitely answer those questions in email. Everyone who has who attended, who has registered, basically will get an email, follow-up email with uh, with a link to uh, uh, with a link to answer of question, uh, answer answering their questions as well as the uh, the, the material and the recording. Um, so uh, after this webcast. Definitely, if you if you like this webcast, if you're a technical person or if you're just interested in getting introduced to Fiber Channel or you're an expert in Fiber Channel and just want to brush up what's going on, definitely visit fiberchannel.org slash webcasts link. Uh, all the recordings are posted there. Uh, there are a lot of blogs and technical articles available there. Uh, uh, most of the uh, published material is available there. Um, all, uh, it's a great, great 
uh, website to understand how fiber channel works, what uh, what are the different technical details, and all that. So basically, it's a very very good resource for you to have. We uh, from Fiber Channel Network we do uh, uh, webinars, education webinars every couple of months. Uh, the next one coming up is on 15th of October. Uh, it basically talks about the topic of the new NVMe standards that uh, the FC NVMe standards actually called FC NVMe 2 uh, that were adopted early this year and what are the new enhancements that happened in the protocol and and uh, uh, in the in in basically they're defining the protocol. So definitely do register at the link here. This will also be part of the email that you'll receive. So. With that, I want to thank you for uh, your time and for attending, and thank you, Dave and Barry, for presenting. This was a great webinar, and thank you, uh, thank you for that. And goodbye now. Have a good day, guys. Yep. Thank you all. Bye.